So the philosophy and practice, the, the practice of Aloha Aina have been a root of well-being and sustainability in Hawaii for generations, and I believe that we need it now today more than ever. And when I talk about Aloha Aina from a OEV perspective, we mean not only a love for the land, but a real deep and personal sense of connection to place, an unswerving connection, um, commitment, Kalamai, to the health of our natural world and a recognition of the centrality of political self-determination to human well-being. So I want to start um, in the spirit of honoring our past by introducing you to my uh, tutu kane, Lyman David Kai Kaopua. And I never actually got to meet my tutu. He died when he was just 31 years old. He was in the US military serving at that time. Um, but of all the stories that I heard of my tutu, he was two things, if anything, a fisherman and a jokester. And um, he was from a family that over generations and generations of living on the Kona and Kohala coast of the Big Island developed this knowledge of how to live sustainably from the ocean in a balanced way so that the resources could produce generation after generation. Um, he and his uh, parents, when they moved to Kalihi O'ahu, carried this knowledge with them and he uh, was a fisherman and diver mainly up around the uh, east and, and northeast coast of O'ahu. Um, in this picture, he was stationed when he was in the military on Johnston Atoll, and he sent this photo back to his wife, my popo, saying that her O'ahu eel had caught two big Johnston eels. <laughs> um, but because he died so young, when he was 31, my mom was only three at the time, you know, we, his descendants, were cut off from these generations of knowledge that he, had ca that he carried with him. And although I'm not uh, a fisher person, over the last several years, I've been real inspired by this olelo no eo. Ika moana no kaia, liu liu ia na pono lava When the fish are in the ocean, get your gear ready. And it seems like a pretty simple instruction, yeah? Um, but I think it speaks really profoundly, not only to those of us who are fisher people, but to those of us who aren't, like myself, um, to those of us who are Native Hawaiian, and the, to those of us who are not that we need to pay close attention to our environmental conditions and prepare for them, be ready for them. So if we were to look to our oceans, to our horizons and far beyond, what are the conditions that we are seeing right now that we need to get our gear ready for? Well, there's a growing consensus in the world, as well as here, right here in Hawaii, that we're facing these really serious overlapping crises and problems, peak oil, climate change, dead zones in our oceans, rapid population growth, but coupled with a real growing inequality between the haves and have-nots, um, all of these things impacting our futures. In fact, in 2006, um, a, a consortium, a group of 1,300 scientists from 95 different countries released what they called the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. It, go Google it. Um, in that report, they said that 60% of the world's ecosystem services, the ability to produce fresh water, yeah, um, all the kinds of things that our um, natural economies produce, were being degraded in ways that could not be sustained. They, they use the words um, exactly. In many cases, we are literally living on borrowed time. Um, so they talk about, for example, that you know, in the last 50 years, a, um, 20% of the Earth's living reef systems have been degraded. And we know that from marine cli and climate scientists here in Hawaii that our own reefs, in some cases, they're saying on some islands that just within the last 10 years, we've lost a quarter of our living reef systems. And think about how dependent we are as islanders upon our reefs and our fisheries. Um, they're also saying that you know if we don't turn things around, not like this is a problem far in the future. If we don't turn things around in a generation, maybe two generations, we're gonna be causing irreparable harm, irreversible harm. Another condition that we really need to pay attention to is our complete over-dependence on fossil fuels. And again, here living on an island, you know, this is not just about what we, um, the gas we put in our cars or when we flip the switch on, the electricity that powers our home, but how our food gets here, how we store it, the clothes we're wearing, the medicines that m many of us give our families, all of these um, things we're, are dependent. Right now, we are over-dependent upon um, a fossil fuel-based economy. 
And this is, of course, an abnormal sort of situation, right? One of the ways that imperial power functions is to normalize the abnormal. And the way that we're living now is both abnormal in terms of Hawaiian history and in terms of human history more generally. In the last 50 years, humans, particularly those living in what's um, often called the global north, have consumed more of the Earth's resources than at any other comparable point in human history. It's simply not a sustainable situation. Um, Every two years, the US military produces this report, which they call the Joint Operating Environment, where the Joint Forces Command gets together and they look at what are some of the um, world conditions and context that will be impacting the US military's operations. Um, this graph comes from the 2010 report, and I just want you to pay attention to right at the end, this huge gap. What that represents is the top part of it is they project by the 2030s a 50% increase in the world's demand for oil. And the sloping line is the rapidly declining supply. Yeah, so what we're looking at is the potential for major political and economic instability that happens when we're living in an economy that's based upon fossil fuels and we're looking at this kind of scenario. Now, to bring it sort of back to home, you know, we, let's think about the children in our own lives. So think about the children that are in your life. These are my two daughters. Um, my eldest is going to be my age in the 2030s when the USJOE is predicting this major gap, right? My younger one is just about to enter um, kindergarten next year and she'll be graduating in the year 2027. And when we think about our keiki, we really have to ask ourselves, is the education that we're giving them really getting their metaphorical gear ready for the conditions that we're looking at in our world today? Now, lest we get really depressed about this whole situation, um, we should remember that there is no such thing as the future. Yeah? There isn't a single future that's predetermined out there already. There are multiple possible futures, and every day with the decisions we make, we are either opening possible futures or foreclosing possible futures. And in that regard, education is a fundamentally futures-oriented enterprise. We are actively creating futures for our individual keiki as well as for society, or we're foreclosing possible futures. So when we think about this question, what does 21st century education look like? A lot of times we kind of see an image like this. Yeah, we envision more um, information and communications technologies, a, a more deeply integrated technological world that connects us across the globe. And this is fine, but today I want to um, offer you some different kinds of images of what 21st century education can and I think should look like. Education that's based on the, this wisdom of Aloha'ina, the practices of Aloha'ina that come from our kupuna. Um, education that really takes seriously the, the actual conditions that we see in our environment today. Um, and this, this kind of education is, um, you know, not just coming out of my head. This is things that are happening in communities all over the islands, in Kipuka. And the images that I'm going to show you are um, particularly from Halaukumana, a school that my family has been involved with since its founding in 2001. So I believe that we need education and schools that engage our young people in regular observation of the natural environment. This requires, of course, time outdoors. They have to be in our streams with our reefs. Um, you know, if we want our young people to be able to steward and care for and care about our watersheds and our streams, they got to know where they are. Um, and I think that many of us could, could think that, well, do I know where the, do my kids know where the streams are in my, in my ahupua? Um, Aloha Aina requires a very close attentiveness to Aina, to our lands and waters, our stars, um, our various forces in our natural environment, and it requires that over time. We also need schools and an educational system that encourage our young people to fall in love with Aina. So it's not just about observation, sort of from a distant, universal perspective, but really to develop these close, personal relationships with place, with our soils, with our native plants, with our reef fishes. We need um, education that allows our young people and encourages our young people to compose beautiful mele and oli and stories, poetry about the beauty of our bays and our valleys and our birds and our fishes. Um, 
we need a uh, aloha aina that encourages that kind of relationship. Yeah, think about what it means or what it, the experience has been like for you to fall in love with somebody and what it takes to sustain that love over time and the kind of sacrifices that you're willing to make for someone that you love. We need to encourage that kind of a personal relationship and connection between our keiki and our, and our aina. Uh, of course, um, aloha aina and education based on aloha aina is not just about good feelings, it's about hard work. And as the great organizer and intellectual and aloha aina prophet George Jarrett Helm said, do your homework. Do your homework. Um, and here in Hawaii, we're so lucky because we have this vast archive of kupuna knowledge, both in our oral and now written traditions, um, our place names, our olelo no eo, our mo'olelo, about how to live on this aina in balanced ways. So we need schools and teachers and educational system that is engaging our young people with this archive and helping them to think about how to use this kupuna knowledge in their own current context with their feet firmly planted in the soil. We also need schools and educational systems that engage our young people in rebuilding the technological structures that allowed for balanced life today. So these are just two examples, you know, the Awai systems. The Awai systems are the backbone of the Ahupua'a system. In Ahupua'a that had, um, and some still have, but many are streams that run all the way to the ocean have been um, disconnected in different ways. We need to be able to rebuild um, systems like our Awai system. So the Awai system is an irrigation system that leaves water in the watershed area, but enables um, relatively large scale, organic, local food production that utilizes solar energy rather than fossil fuel based inputs. Really important. This is um, some students from Halau Kumana uh, rebuilding the Awai at Aihualama, which is an ili aina in uh, this valley of Manoa. And then, of course, um, our va'a, which, again, like the Awai system, is um, a technology that utilizes wind power rather than, rather than um, fossil fuel energy. And as Kalepa um, Babayan you know, expressed so uh, eloquently today for us, these have such power and such a strong history within our uh, region of enabling great trade and migration um, and recreational travel. And we need to really think about um, how to restore our va'a and proliferate them uh, in various kinds of ways. We also need an educational system and curriculum and assessments that value collaborative learning and place-based learning, which right now the Hawaii State Ass Assessment absolutely does not. Yeah. Although um, the Hawaiian culture and many of the cultures that have now gathered here in Hawaii are much more collectivist oriented, community oriented, the dominant educational paradigm is still a very competitive and highly individualistic one. And the assessment system is built around nurturing that. Um, but of course, aloha aina is not a competition. It's not race to the top. It's not who can get there first. Some, you know, education is not about some people win and some people lose. Aloha aina based education is about working together to find balance and living in, in balance with the aina and with each other. And then of course, aloha aina is about meaningful political autonomy. So we need educational systems that encourage our young people to ask tough questions about power. Who has power over lands and waters? What do they do with it? What are the impacts of what um, those uses of lands and waters are? And what have communities in Hawaii's rich history done to protect and enhance the health of our lands and waters? We need education that asks our young people to think about their kuleana and to reflect on how they can act based on aloha aina. So what I'm um, you know, basically presenting and arguing to you today is that we need a radical transformation of our dominant educational system. And we need it very soon because the conditions that we can see around us are really urgent. They're not something that we can uh, maybe you know, 100 years down the road. We're really talking about within a generation or two. And in order to do that, oh, sorry. In order to do that, um, we know that change doesn't happen on its own, that it requires people developing the political will to make that happen, demanding that kind of change and pitching in to make it happen. In uh, 2012, last year in um, the First Nations territories of what's now known as Canada, First Nations and settler peoples came together 
to initiate a movement to demand that the Canadian settler state really take justice for First Nations people seriously. And as part of this um, ongoing movement, um, Chief Teresa Spence of the Atta, Atta Wapiskat Nation, First Nation, uh, went on a hunger strike for six weeks. She camped out in um, an island on the Ottawa River and drank only medicinal tea and fish broth for that whole entire time. Uh, why fish broth? Well, Leanne Simpson, who's an Anish Anishinaabe scholar, um, explains, and I'm going to read this so I can be faithful to her words. Why fish broth? What is the cultural significance? She says that fish broth symbolizes hardship and sacrifice. It symbolizes the strength of our ancestors. It means survival. Fish broth sustained them through the hardest of circumstances with the parallel understanding that it cannot sustain one forever. Chief Spence is eating fish broth because metaphorically, colonialism has kept indigenous peoples on a fish broth diet for generations upon generations. With respect to our dominant educational systems here in Hawaii, we too have been content to let our young people subsist on a diet of fish broth. But why should we do so when we could be enjoying and benefiting from the abundant knowledge of our kupuna that we have access to and that we can have access to? We cannot go back to the past, but I would argue that we cannot spend another day, not another generation, without education that takes aloha aina seriously, both for Hawaiian people and for all people in Hawaii. The conditions that we're facing impact all of us, right? We see um, that there are, again, kipuka of this kind of education going on. This is a picture um, of the Kokula Uka eighth grade um, project, my daughter's class, um, walking through the Ahupua'a of Makiki, tracking the movement of their stream, all the way from the tops of the mountains, and they walked all the way down, followed it. Where is it channelized? Where is it diverted? Where are their source points of pollution? Um, what's going on with the stream? What does its health look like? As we were driving down Punahou one day, as I picked her up from school, she said, Mom, you see that building right there? That's where the stream goes under, under the ground, it gets channelized, and then you can barely see, then it's just a trickle after that. Um, that's the kind of knowledge that we need our keiki to have, yeah, that we need to encourage. So we have these kipuka that are already existing. The next step for us, I believe, is that we need to grow them, extend them, and proliferate them, and build the political will to do so. Mahalo. Thank mm -hmm. you.